Okay, so I'm very happy to um, introduce our speaker today, Jan Niklas Range, comes to us from Salzburg University, where he's doing a postdoc on um, studying uh, mighty drive and yeast. Um, but before he uh, worked on yeast, he worked on lemurs, actually. Even before that, he worked on humans for his bachelor's. Jan studied humans in um, cooperation games for his bachelor's, and after that, for his master's, he studied um, primates in Madagascar, the forest, social behavior. For his PhD, he worked on wild house mice, in particular, one of the most interesting aspects of, I think, of any uh, area of biology where it wasn't that long ago, it was controversial that genes influence behavior. Um, but for decades, we've known that there are genes that act in their own interest um, and not necessarily in the interest of the organism itself. And so this is probably one of the best studied examples of a uh, selfish gene uh, that causes myotic drive. And so just to let you know, the talk will be recorded. So um, yes, thank you. Thank you. You just got to turn on the... This one here will be good. Okay, should work now and get the pointer. Okay, yeah. Thank you very much, Dustin, and uh, for the uh, introduction. Um, and yes, what I'm going to talk about today is um, how selfish genetic element, selfish supergene manipulates behavior in house mice. And uh, that is mainly sort of the story of my PhD work. Um, and um, later on, I will talk a little bit about, you know, the more genomics uh, stuff that I'm working on now that's also related to this general uh, field, but um, it's going to start with more uh, of a behavior focus first. So I hope that <laughs> that is the right audience for that. Um, and yeah, so when we let this work, yeah. when we think about the genome, um, it's basically uh, always thought of as this huge cooperative enterprise where loci genes work together to build an organism that then you know they share in the same fate of its fitness. Um, and um, it's less discussed, you know how. There's actually conflict in the genome rather than only cooperation between uh, the genes. Um, this cooperation is usually best exemplified by the fact that uh, loci generally alleles segregate according to Mendelian transmission, which means that each allele in a diploid genome should have about 50% uh, chance to be transmitted to the next generation. And if you think about it, of course, for each gene and for each allele, uh, there's a huge cost associated with that because every allele should you know, want, if you will, uh, to be transmitted to the next generation rather than the homologous allele on the other chromosome. So there's a huge fitness cost here, but it is, of course, in the greater uh, scheme of things, beneficial for the organism to uh, have this average 50% chance of transmission. And if we think about, well, there are actually examples where we don't, where this transmission does not work much like this. Yeah. yeah. Uh, work as in as intended, and so these are cases of non-Mendelian transmission, where you know if you would imagine rather than having like seventy-five percent of his piece be uh, yellow, maybe almost all of them would be yellow, and that would be hard to explain by any sort of combination of, uh, of at least by any dominance or recessive effect. And so rather, this is then uh, attributable then to to really non-random, um, non-fifty percent non-Mendelian uh, transmission. And elements that engage in this sort of thing are generally broadly described as selfish genetic elements because they manipulate transmission in their advantage, increasing their odds of being in the uh, next generation. One way they can do that, which is not the topic today, but I think, still think it's an important to characterize it here as well, is that uh, they can do it within a generation. This would be something like retrotransposons that copy themselves in within the genome to multiple places, thereby increasing their frequency and, of course, also their transmission at the end because they they will be more common in the genome to begin with. Um, and the other largely uh, classifiable part here as meiotic drive is, even though there's more nuance to that, but we'll focus on this today, um, is sort of intergenerationally, meaning that they really reach their frequency through the next generation. And how they do that, for example, is if you have two alleles, uh, capital D and, and small d, um, and the capital D is the driving allele, um, what can happen is, either in spermatogenesis, but also can happen in spores, 
um, more broadly is that uh, this capital D driving allele eliminates harms in any way, um, you know, deleteriously affects those uh, small uh, D um, uh, spore sperms that, um, that carry the non-driving allele and thereby basically increasing transmission to up to 100% to the next generation of sperm that carry this driving allele. And um, this is the sort of case we're going to be looking at today in house mice. But first, to give you um, some examples of, of that, for example, these, these myotic drivers, even though it's a, you know, some classic people will, will say, okay, this is actually not true myotic drive because it has to happen in females. But anyway, it is nowadays classified as myotic drive. Is, um, for example, can be really simple. In fish and yeast, for example, it's really just one gene, one, one locus uh, that can cause this effect, that can cause uh, the uh, dead gametes uh, that don't carry the driving locus uh, in uh, sporulation. And then you have really distorted transmission where almost all the spores, then uh, the next generation uh, carries this driving allele. But these cases can also be much more complex. For example, very classically in, uh, in fire ants, you have a system where uh, within the genome there's multiple inversions, so really just re large rearrangements of, on the chromosome where the sequence is you know, literally inverted. And it's a large region rather, rather than just one gene, one, uh, one tiny locus that can encompass you know, almost the entire chromosome, uh, as you would see as the case in, in mice as well. And it can then have, because there's a lot of genetic information encoded in that region that is distorted, it can then have quite uh, drastic uh, consequences. Um, for example, in this case, in the fire end case, social behavior is affected in such a way that the colony structure between those that carry um, this driving allele uh, and those that do not is completely different, where you have a multi-queen colony on the one hand, you have a single queen colony on the other hand. So thereby showing that, you know, if you really have a lot of um, genetic information linked together, which is a sort of super gene, then you know, selection can also work on really complicated uh, behavioral outcomes. And uh, so that, that's, an, I think, an important primer to believe me what I, when I'm talking about later. Uh, this is actually something that can be, can be found. Uh, so the study system that I've been working on is the T-haplotype in house mice. And it's very similar to the case I just mentioned in fire ants. It's a really large super gene. So you can see here that um, it encompasses almost a third of well, actually a bit more than a third of uh, one of the autosomes, chromosome 17 in house mice, and not, not a sex chromosome. Uh, it's really old, and it links together this large bit of um, genetic variation that is transmitted then basically without any changes other than mutations, for example, so no recombination uh, to the, through the generations and sort of in its own evolutionary trajectory because it's not exchanging any information or virtually no <laughs> information. This will probably change a little bit in the coming years as far as I heard. Uh, but almost no recombination, basically, with the um, homologous chromosome 17. Um, and how it works is very similar to the figure I showed previously, where, just now with mice, um, where in males that are heterozygous for the T haplotype, they will pass on if they mate with a wild type, so a female that does not carry the T haplotype, almost exclusively all of the offspring will carry the T haplotype as well. So it's about 90 to some labs, 100%. There are different variants of the T haplotype that are not very well classified, but we know that they differ in some aspects, but it's still something that is, you know, being uncovered more and more nowadays. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, that is pattern in terms of how strong the drive is. And if you would only know that about the T haplotype, you would generally expect, well, it should go to fixation, right? Every mouse should carry the T haplotype um, because this is such a strong advantage. But of course, the, re the fact that we can study it means that it exists in an intermediate state where not every mouse carries it. Otherwise, we wouldn't see any drive. Um, and so they, it has important fitness, uh, fitness disadvantages as well compared to the homologous uh, chromosome, the wild type chromosome. Um, I should also say that in females that are heterozygous, if they mate with a male that is, uh, does not carry the diaplotype, it's normal transmission. So in that case, it's just 50% transmission. It really only works in spermatogenesis, uh, and not in the, in the females. It has no effect there on, on transmission. But what it has an effect on is if you have a heterozygous mouse, a heterozygous male, mated with a heterozygous female, in that case, you would, of course, expect many of the offspring to be homozygous because it drives in males. It's normally transmitted in females. So many, many mice will actually have the uh, diaphragm type homozygously. And that is one of the first uh, big 
detrimental effects of the t haplotype because there are two outcomes to this. These mice are either inviable, will never be born, they die in utero, which you know I will also talk a bit uh, about later. There seem to be really strong, recessive, deleterious mutations on the t haplotype. Or there are some variants of the t haplotype where they are uh, viable, but they, the males at the very least, and sometimes the females as well, will be sterile. So one way or the other, it's a huge fitness disadvantage to be homozygous for the t haplotype. And in those cases where it's actually lethal, it immediately makes clear there's a limit to the frequency of the t haplotype in a population that cannot be in every mouse homozygously, because then uh, there would be no more mice, essentially. Um, and the other, much more recent, in uh, addition to that, well, in terms of uh, finding out about it, um, detrimental effects of the t haplotype comes in when mice, when female mice mate with multiple males in the same estrus cycle, thereby the males then engage in sperm competition. And that is something where usually there's a clear idea of who should be the winner in those situations in terms of the males. There's usually an, an advantage, I think, of the first male that, that mates with the, with the female. Uh, so there's clear um, expectations, but when a t haplotype is involved, um, instead of having some chance of being uh, of siring some offspring, that male would sire almost no offspring. Uh, and the reason for that is that the mechan well, it's not quite clear, but it's pretty clear that the sperm of the male that is heterozygous for the t haplotype um, is damaged by the mechanism of how the t haplotype uh, increases its um, frequency in the next generation. So the T sperm, obviously, there's something going on there that harms the sperm that carry the uh, that don't carry the T haplotype, right? Um, but at the same time, that sort of it's something called poison antidote mechanism also damages the T, -T haplotype sperm to an extent that doesn't matter in a single mating. But when competing then over fertilization with another male, the sperm are slower and they are just a little less successful. And that is of course enough when when the numbers of uh, in, in sperm competition are involved to reduce their fitness to essentially zero. And <clears throat> what we've then been thinking about is, okay, uh, the more we've learned about the detrimental effects of the t haplotype, the more it was, the question went from, okay, why isn't it everywhere? The question became, okay, why didn't, didn't it go extinct uh, yet? Because it's such a deleterious effect, and in our own populations and in others, you can see that it's dying out oftentimes. Uh, so what's, what's going on there? What could help the t haplotype survive? And that's sort of where my my work began and we were thinking about basically what what about behavior here because we've known other systems and there's so much genetic data and uh, genetic information encoded in the t haplotype and transmitted is there anything behaviorally that these these uh, mice could do um or that the haplotype could do by manipulating the behavior of the mice um to help its its survival and so where we study this um is um in a long-term study system uh, in near Zurich, that was set up by Barbara Koenig and then later uh, transferred over to Anna Lindholm, my PhD supervisor. And what they've been doing there is for, gosh, no, more than 20 years, uh, have been studying that, yeah, well, the house mice, wild, genetically wild house mice caught in the wild, brought to this, this place, studied their behavior sort of in a semi-wild environment because those mice, they were brought in there. And they could leave any time, but they give they are given food and water access and their shelter. You know, there's the, you know these these houses, of course, here some of you will. Um, so there's there's a lot of um, uh, you know reason for these mice to stay in the population. Uh, and so they've sort of you know started this population. It's been ongoing for for 20 years, and more than 10,000 mice have have lived and died in that population. Uh, and importantly, they can leave, enter any time they want. Um, what we do is we genetically sample them, so we know which, you know, every mouse when they are born, and then later this pup became this adult, and then later this adult died, and we tracked them throughout their lives. So we have a pretty good idea who, who's in that population at any given moment. And then what we became curious about is that we saw some indications that the T. haplotype mice are actually, um, they appear to be disappearing from the population more often than mice that don't carry the T. haplotype. And so that, that means that a mouse that is uh, genotyped uh, as, an, as an offspring is never found again as a corpse, is never found again as an adult. And so there is, of course, there's a bit of influence going on here, there, where it could have some noise where we don't see all the corpses, but if we look at all the corpses, uh, we don't find a difference in, you know, mortality between uh, the genotypes. So then we became curious and, and looked at it a bit more in terms of the question of, well, does the T leave 
the barn more often, uh, this purse from the barn more often uh, than the wild type. And sort of the verbal argument, I will get into that a bit more in detail later, is, um, well, if the tea is doing very poorly in multiple mating situations, and multiple mating situations in house mice are primarily determined by the density. So if there's more males around, there will be more often multiple mating. So if the tea emigrates from dense populations, more likely than the wild type does, which also has, you know, benefits from it, you know, avoiding competition and all that, um, then that could help the tea to be more often an immigrant into other populations and sort of keep the tea alive. So that's the verbal argument. I will get into more detail about that later. But what we found in in the population is that yes, if we look at the population density, um, you know, this, this, it, it's steadily rising in that population. And so there's a lot of variation over time in terms of how dense the, how dense the barn environment is. And we look at, okay, the um, sort of the frequency of individuals that disappear when they are young, never to be seen again as corpses or adults, which here we call them dispersal, but technically you could say it's just disappearance. But anyway, um, that is the inference because of, you know, no mortality, right? Because of no mortality differences. What we see then is, generally speaking, the denser the population is, the larger the difference between uh, dispersal propensity of tea-carrying individuals versus wild-type uh, individuals. And so that really got us curious and then changed entirely what we want to be working on for the next couple of years. Um, because it seemed like such a such a uh, you know nice effect that we need to be studied a bit further, um, and I should say here as well that there's no difference here in terms of the sexes in this uh, case. So the T doesn't I don't know why it automated to this, but uh, yeah, so I'm too slow maybe. But uh, uh, so we what we set out then is to experimentally try and verify what's going on here um, to have a bit more of a sense of well, is this just you know random result or can we can we draw some conclusions from that? And so what we've done is. We did experimentally test this person, but what we also did with the mice that then we tested this person on was first to really rudimentarily uh, set up uh, an experiment where we want to test the sort of explorativeness of these mice. Because there's, you, there's a lot of literature on the idea of, well, if you have, you know, if you're more likely to disperse, there's a whole range of behaviors that might be affected as well uh, called the dispersal syndrome. And one of them is explorativeness. There's also others like uh, activity, depending on who you ask. Um, and so what we've done is we've also measured activity. There's no difference there. But um, we've also looked at explorativeness in a very simple setup, I would say. So here we just, we have mice that we put into a cardboard tube. That cardboard tube is enveloped with uh, paper that they can very easily break, push out. Um, but they also have the chance, the choice to, you know, just stay in the, the tube. We place them into this sort of setup where we really care about, okay, how quickly does the mouse leave that on the one hand, but also how much of the space uh, is being explored in a 25-minute uh, interval. Um, and so, you know, very crudely, we just wanted to know a bit more about these mice that go into this uh, experiment later on. And of course, as you can easily imagine, there's a lot of individual variation. It might be due to a million things, like environmental noise as well. Um, you know, that's, of course, being placed into that. It's, it's probably quite an uh, intensive, ex intensive ex experience as well. But just to give you, like, the range of behaviors is, like, sped up. So one minute here would be the entire the entire experiment, and you can see just okay, there's a lot going on. Some mice, you know, this video is playing, but uh, <laughs> this mouse is just really not not leaving this uh, this environment. Um, and so you know, we we're, we're interested in all of these things, and that's you know, some are really fast explorers. So I think it's all that like you know how, how quickly they were exploring. And um, what we've done is okay. Well, the big question, of course, in all these cases is okay. You have a lot of variables now. What are you actually interested in? So we. We, uh, you know, put all these together into a PCA, but I'm, I'm going to show you uh, some of the raw value, uh, values as well here. Um, I think, yeah. So the thing is, okay, as we know, there's a lot of there's a lot of noise in these conditions. So one of the things that we we cared about, as I said, is like, okay, how fast are these mice um, leaving? So lower is is fast, lower is faster, uh, leaving the tube that they're placed in. And here it's just visually, I mean, it's going into this direction of, of uh, uh, the T mice in orange usually um, being a bit faster. We also have things like, okay, how many changes in compartments? So how often did they change from one to the other in a given interval? Of course, all of these are correlated, right? That's why we put them all in, in a PCA to analyze them together. And then finally, what, what actually got us started to do this experiment, because we had, we had found this even with, with small sample sizes and replicated and over and over and over again, we see this sort of picture uh, emerging um, uh, where 
you know, you could see how many compartments were explored in that time frame. Uh, and, um, you know, the more the more explorative, obviously, and, and the T, you know, over and over again, where the mice that, you know, just happened to, to um, explore more compartments in that uh, time frame. And so, well, I well, know I didn't copy it over, but yeah, I wanted to show you the PCA. But anyway, the PCA would also would also see. It would also, I just changed that, and I didn't copy it over apparently. But yeah, um, the PCA you would also see that there's a lot of noise in the data, right? And so to take it with a grain of salt, but it's just so ha it is statistically significant. But I don't think you know that's the main point of it. It's just okay. There is a difference, but it might be really subtle between between the genotypes. But it goes in the direction of more explorativeness uh, of the T carriers over the wild type carriers. Okay, um, so then we set up, and I think you've all seen something similar here, uh, to some extent, uh, we set up enclosures with these mice um, to, you know, of different densities. We get about like a low density, which would be four males, four females, high density, eight males, eight females, roughly modeled in terms of the square meters and the density after what was happening in the barn environment to really try and replicate on a smaller scale these um, what happened in the long-term study, and we placed them in these enclosures, and the idea was to, you know, let them mate freely, have offspring for about three months, and at the same time study who leaves, I'm going to show you how, um, who leaves that population, because we really cared about this juvenile dispersal, they got to grow up in that environment, and then they leave for whatever reason, and then we care about, okay, what's the genotype of those mice that have left versus um, those that, that didn't leave. Um, now, that didn't work as intended, um, because while we had, you know, 600 or so offspring over, you know, uh, many, many replicates, um, the offspring decided not to emigrate, not to disperse from the setup. Uh, so, you know, we have like 600 mice and then we have less than 10 of those actually leaving it that we can't really do anything. But uh, we have such a nice sample size imagined there, you know, this would really help us to, to solve that question. Instead, the uh, founders of the population, they couldn't leave immediately, so the access to leave was blocked because there's a lot of fighting it in, in the beginning going on. So when this was settled a bit more, they were able to leave. Um, and um, so we analyzed, in terms of dispersal, the data on the founders because, you know, a good fraction of them left. And so we then say, well, okay, well, let me analyze that. And they were also of a similar age, but it still made sense, about 40, 50 days, which is still, you know, within the time frame that we estimated um, dispersal might have taken place in the long-term study. Okay, how did we actually look at dispersal here? Um, we have the setup. That was also, you know, was inspired by actually by someone who's, who's working here now. Um, and um, it's uh, basically a water barrier. So this this right here carries, uh, it has water in it. And you can also see that there's a, um, you know, a wall basically. So they can't jump over the water into the next tube because they would ob obviously do that. They really don't like swimming in water. And um, so for them, that's sort of uh, something that has been done a couple of times where you use water as a barrier. And... Those mice that really want to go somewhere else, that is the idea, will cross that barrier, will then get to a cage where there's, you know, shelter, food and water, should be quite attractive. You know, basically the same thing, just not the other mice. And um, uh, yeah, so those events, we then go in the morning because they do it overnight and see if, you know, someone has dispersed. Uh, and we, yeah, we come take them on the population and count them as a disperser. And then we look at, okay, who, who left the population? And um, you can see what, what's going on there uh, overnight is that, um, you know, all those mice, they will really, they will check out the water over and over and over again. So we didn't monitor it every single one with cameras because it was not feasible at the time. But, you know, sometimes we put cameras there just to see what's happening. If they don't cross, cross all the time, would kind of invalidate our idea. But they don't do that. What they do is they really expect the water a lot and they don't dare to, to go in really. Sometimes they fall in and they immediately get out again. But that's clearly not the same thing as really going through, swimming through it and, and, uh, and leaving the population. Uh, and so they will also start nesting in the tube. So we have to evict them from that. And then we have to clean it. And, you know, there's a lot going on. But, uh, but yeah, at the end of the day, what we find is that of those mice that, um, that do decide to, to, you know, swim through that water, leave the population. Here now we actually have a strong sex bias um, that we didn't have in the barn. Um, so I think the competition for females in the barn is much stronger than, than in those enclosures. But um, you see that overall, you know, not that many data points, but what we could get out of it is, okay, there is a difference, the exact same essentially as we find in, in, um, in the long-term study, just with a few, well, many less data points, but therefore more, but more controlled on the other hand. 
uh, that the, the, especially in the males, of course, here, the T carriers are more likely to leave the population. Okay, so that, that was nice to see that we have an experiment that can actually show the same thing, uh, even if done completely differently um, from the long term study. And uh, then the question was, as I teased earlier, um, well, why would this evolve? And I said, well, it would be great for the T haplotype to then leave the populations and um, avoid much multiple mating. I mean, that was really the main thing in our head that, you know, avoiding these, these dense areas where many males compete with fertilization, where they're really unfit. If there's any way a T haplotype would be, in, you know, would modify behavior in such a way that they disperse more, that T haplotype should be selected uh, compared to other T haplotypes primarily. And um, yeah, so what we've done to try and try and understand what's going on there, we simulated the evolution of, of dispersal in T carriers versus the wild type. So we've taken you know, everything we knew about the haplotype, the drive, the homozygous lethality, the disadvantage in multiple mating, and put that, put mice with uh, and without the haplotype together in a large world where they can, where there's multiple populations and there's a lot of stochasticity in terms of um, population density that is changing over time as well. So there's, we're trying to incorporate these factors as, as much as uh, made sense. And the important bit is that, you know, we assume here in the model, okay, there is a locus within the diaplotype and in the same region on the wild type homologous chromosome that determines the genetically uh, based dispersal propensity. So there's just a locus that encodes, okay, between zero and one, what are the odds that this individual will disperse as a juvenile? Um, and um, then uh, we also have simulations where there's a density component as well encoded, so uh, genetically determined you know, if it's that dense, how likely am I to leave the population? And this locus can mutate and is passed on on this uh, drive locus. And if we do that for a lot of generations, what we find here is that now it's in, in red because people liked it more when this when we when we looked at it. Um, now that the haplotype is is in red um, versus blue with the wild type, and uh, you can see that if we just have like a locus that says, okay, how likely are is this mouse to this purse? independent of density, what evolves is generally a higher propensity. And it's not just a little bit, right? I mean, it's quite uh, considerable in terms of, you know, that, that this is behavior that, you know, it's also deadly, you know, there, there's certain mortality um, associated with this person, like would be expected in the wild as well. And um, so it's not just, a, you know, no cost uh, behavior. Um, and so the T's are more likely to, to disperse. And so I'm calling this natural condition because I'm going to vary that in a, in a moment. Uh, that means just, okay, they, they are homozygous lethal and they engage in sperm competition and they're bad at it, right? And they drive at 90% frequency. And if we do the same thing, but now we allow a density dependent component to evolve as well, what we see is um, a little weaker than we see in the in the barn situation. So these are just like data points averaged over all kinds of, uh, over many simulations. And you see that what generally evolves is that the T also has a bit more of a density dependence on average in uh, in the dispersal, like we saw in the barn, but a weaker effect here, so weaker than I than I um, thought it would we would happen we would see. And there's also a density dependence in the wild type, as we also saw in the barn, but a little less strong. Now the big question is, of course, the nice thing about simulations is, okay, now we know, okay, this this makes sense. What we are sort of intuiting that it could that this should evolve if possible. But the question is, okay, why does it evolve, right? What is driving uh, this this evolution of dispersal? In the simulations, you can, of course, just go ahead and vary the conditions. So what we do is, uh, so what we saw before is the top left, right? We have multiple mating to some extent, and we have homozygous inviability, so zero viability. And then we see the strong uh, sort of difference evolve. But if we then go ahead and we, you know, make the T a bit more um, viable, in terms of either really increasing the homozygous viability from left to right, or we decrease the, um, you know, how often females mate multiply, then in both directions, the less deleterious that the haplotype is, the less this difference in dispersal evolves, right? And you actually get to a point where if there's a 25% viability of T homozygous uh, individuals and no female multiple mating, then you essentially have the same dispersal evolving in both. So that's that's quite nice because there's still drive there. Um, so it's not really, you know, so much driven by drive, even though you know, we can see another example in a moment. Uh, but it's really linked to how deleterious the haplotype is. And contrary to my expectations, I thought, okay, the most important bit here is is this axis. So how, how 
how deleterious is it uh, is the haplotype in terms of female multiple mating. But instead, we also see that the homozygous viability also um, produces higher uh, dispersal in the diaplotype. So both deleterious traits, we could just see deleterious per se, it seems like, is important when it comes to um, the dispersal evolution in the diaplotype. Um, and I think I have something that says that. Yeah, exactly. So the more deleterious it is, the more red it is here. And if you have a really strong diaplotype on the bottom right, you actually see more dispersal as well in the in the wild type. Now, if we generalize this a little bit more, this also is the same picture, which is if we just take drive strength as well into account, which was set at 0.9 before, 90% uh, offspring carry a diaplotype, uh, and so we just you know do homozygous viability at general sort of deleterious effect and drive strength, you can generally see, first of all, I think importantly, that of all these are all the conditions where there's actually a stable balance that evolves, where not one uh, is fixated. If you have both wild type and, and driver, you can see that most cases are actually reddish, right? So in most cases that allow for the survival of both wild type and, uh, and a driver, you see more likely a, uh, a driver increase in dispersal. So that means that if you go out in the wild and you find driver and wild type, you if there's any chance that dispersal difference can evolve, you have an expectation now that it should be the driver um, within that within that survival survivable range, but you do see also that in some cases where the drivers really really fit, um, uh, but not so fit, fit that it fixates, you find a bit more dispersal in the wild type as well. So what what's nice about that is yeah you can sort of generalize your expectations and say well actually if we have systems where dispersal might play a role where there is a driver and it could feasibly evolve because perhaps there's a lot of genetic information linked to the driver. Well, if it's possible, let's look at dispersal. We have a prediction now for for that, um, um, independent of mouse or not, uh, that I think could be interesting to to study whenever uh, it's possible, even though there's not so many systems that come to mind where it's really uh, easily feasible. Okay, so for that part, the conclusion would be, okay, we do see the T mice are more likely to disperse than wild-type mice, both in long-term study and experimental setups and simulations also confirm uh, this direction as well, and here we find, okay, it's the detrimental effects that are countered by this person. Okay, and so that was sort of the story of uh, my PhD work. What I've done more recently uh, is more genomics work, and it's going to be really uh, top level. It's not going to really go into the fine uh, details here, but just a few things that we'll try to learn about the diaplotype um, uh, from a genomic point of view. So the big question really here that, that drives that is, uh, well, it's two million years old, right? It's transmitted as this super gene, what's happening to the diaplotype basically um, on, on, on that uh, genomic scale. And primarily what we're interested in is this idea of deterioration. Uh, and how that works is, well, there's generally this expectation, if you don't have recombination, uh, you should expect to see mut uh, mutations accumulate, uh, which we see in the diaplotype, I mean, clearly even without knowing what's going on, because it is lethal uh, in some cases. Um, homozygous lethal, which is a clear sign of, um, you know, mutation accumulation, even though we haven't, you know, st don't see the sequence where it's going on yet. Um, and so why why do we expect that? Just briefly, the, the theory behind that is, uh, well, if you have a population here of different chromosomes, let's say these are of different dehaplotypes, and you have only, like, maybe one left that uh, does not carry a deleterious mutation in red, uh, then if that individual with that, you know, non- uh, mutated uh, diaplotype uh, dies for whatever stochastic reason, right? Basically, drift. Then, what you could do if you had recombination is well, you could recreate that uh, mutation free chromosome by taking, you know, just randomly having uh, recombination such that uh, unmutated parts of the chromosome come together uh, in a new individual, and thereby you rescue this non mutated variant. But if you don't have recombination, you just end up with, you know, basically population where there's no individual now that uh, doesn't have a mutated uh, chromosome. And very similarly, you also have the same effect, basically, if you have a, a beneficial variant, but it's linked with this um, deleterious variant, then you can't rescue it. You get the selection for the beneficial variant, but you also have the deleterious variant. And very similarly, uh, you also can't really deal with mildly beneficial mutations because you can't just select for this mildly beneficial mutation if it's linked with a deleterious mutation, you end up with uh, not gaining uh, a better uh, variant in that case. 
Okay, um, how do we approach this? Um, just uh, without going into too much detail here, but the really tricky thing is people had short sequencing reads, but there's a lot of repetitive elements in the diaplotype which made it impossible to assemble um, to really get the, the whole sequence of the diaplotype previously. And now we've combined that with different sequencing technologies, but I don't think that's the most interesting part here. But when you look at it now, so this is a, a dot plot, which means that we have on the x-axis the uh, locations on our newly assembled, put together t haplotype uh, chromosome. Um, and we have, we plot this against the positions on the sort of reference black six uh, standard mouse chromosome. What you can see is that the, the red lines are just, I've drawn them in just to highlight the inversions. But um, the point is, what you expect to see generally, if there's no chromosomal variation, uh, you would expect what you see in the uh, gray part here, which is the part that does not carry the t haplotype of chromosome 17, and you just see a straight line, meaning it really maps nicely between our uh, diaplotype chromosome and the reference chromosome. But what you can see then is when you have these uh, lines going in the opposite direction, those are inversions, right? So the sequence of the diaplotype maps invertedly to the uh, reference chromosome. And this was, you know, known, just not uh, looked at it uh, from this point of view, but just basically a sanity check, okay, this is what we expect to see. For differently sized, you can see a very small one here, inversions, a really large one here um, that make up the diaplotype and that um, disable essentially recombination with the homologous chromosome. And what we can look at here now is we actually, what we sequence is a TT heterozygous mouse, because as I said, you know, the diaplotype is lethal when homozygous. So where do we get enough DNA? We can, the embryos are really tiny when they die. It's terrible. You don't really get the DNA that you need for for those sort of projects, now it's getting a bit easier. But back then, <laughs> it wasn't that long ago. But yeah, it changed a lot. Um, so what, we, what we've done is we have created a TT heterozygous mouse, which carries two different naturally occurring t haplotypes from two different populations that together actually create a viable mouse because, well, even clearly they have different lethal mutations and so they can balance each other out. We don't know anything about these mutations, but we just know that the individual is, is viable if it uh, is TT um, TT heterozygous. Okay, so what we can, can do then is we can compare the diversity of those two mice basically by just taking the mouse with the two different diaplotypes and then looking at, okay, how many variants across the genome are heterozygous. And when you do that, this is a mouse that is reproductively, they are isolated populations. We, what we find is that the T is much less variable. So here you can see how many mutations basically differ between the two source populations in the T region and in the wild type region, in the wild type region, we have much more going on in terms of mutations that the two populations that are completely isolated. You can't, uh, so this mouse is sterile, right? You can't, these populations can't mate and produce a, um, a fertile offspring. So they're really isolated. And yet the T variant um, is much more similar between the two populations than the, than the wild type region, yeah. which means one interpretation is that, well, the T, um, uh, you know, has more recently spread to both populations than the last, you know, common ancestor, if you will, between the two population has uh, ha has existed, which goes, you know, neatly, you know, with the idea of the T, you know, moving around a lot and spreading to new populations and thereby, you know, being more similar between populations than the populations are in general. But um, we have fewer variants in the T haplotype, but you, you can sort of make predictions of how impactful the variants are by looking at, okay, where in the gene is the mutation? Is there a new stop codon, for example, that completely disrupts the gene? Um, and if you do that, you know, there's just a, you know, um, putative impact of a mutation. But even though we have fewer variants between the two, <laughs> um, we see that the expected impact of those variants between the T uh, populations is higher than the expected impact of mutations between the wild type part of the chromosome, meaning, well, it doesn't accumulate that much uh, mutations in the short time that it has passed since it was in, you know, in a common ancestor between the two T's, but the mutations it does accumulate have likely a larger effect, meaning it's quite, quite quickly deteriorating, even though, you know, not that many mutations are there, but they can't select, as, as I laid out before, against the uh, likely deleterious mutations. I mean, you have to say, the impact is supposed to be high, but in mutations that mean, mut mutations speak, that means it's likely deleterious because most mutations are assumed to be deleterious if they have a large impact because it's harder to get a mutation that has a has an impact and a positive impact at the same time. Um, but one 
One other thing that one can look at, I said the T has a lot of repetitive elements, but actually it doesn't have that many more you know, repetitive elements than the uh, you know wild type part of chromosome 17, which would otherwise you know we also expect deterioration to take the, to take the form of more repetitive elements accumulating, because they're also thought to be generally rather deleterious of anything, so the T can't select against those, but we don't find any evidence of that. And so to sum up that section, um, we have little but very likely very impactful diversity between T, T variants, which supports the idea that, you know, was also previously um, hypothesized that there's a past spread of the T, um, and um, we also see a quick deterioration. But the question is, you know, where, where does this uh, get the T in the future? It's really hard to say because... Um, they are already homozygous lethal. How much worse can it get? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure. So maybe it doesn't have the biggest impact on the T's fitness because it's already there. It's already at that place. It doesn't, you know, so to speak, want to be where it is really lethal in, in homozygotes. Okay, and then finally, it's not, not going to be that long, hopefully. Uh, what I'm working on at the moment in, in Strasbourg is uh, trying to solve, help solve the question that always came up in these conversations, which is, well, how common is this phenomenon? Is this really just you know, this system and a couple of others that have this interesting uh, drive, um, or as the drive people would argue, where it's constantly happening, we just don't see it because, you know, it's obviously very beneficial for a variant to increase in frequency. Uh, and it's very beneficial for the genome to fight against that, where we constantly see fixation and die and extinction of those drivers. But we don't really know. Uh, and I'm not going to fully solve that question, but I'm trying to, trying to do a little part in that. And the problem with this is, well, we don't really know how common these phenomena are because it's really difficult to study. So one thing you could do is, well, you could create a lot of, lot of uh, um, mice with really varying genetic diversity, and then count, you know, for example, the sperm in terms of the genotype. It's really, you know, easy. You just pool them and sequence them, and then you have an idea of how common uh, each uh, uh, allele is in the sperm. But actually, that only, that, first of all, it's really challenging still to do with a lot of mice, but it doesn't really get you very far, because in the T, you wouldn't see anything. Because the T is just slower, the sperm that is, doesn't, doesn't carry the T is not actually gone. So you would only find a specific kind of meiotic driver. Okay, well then what you can do is you cross a lot of mice from diverse backgrounds, and then you look, look at their offspring and uh, try and figure out, okay, what's the allele frequency in their offspring? But gosh, I mean, the genome is large, the litter sizes are, you know, large, but not large enough for this sort of thing. Uh, so you wouldn't really learn anything uh, if you did it this way. So essentially, the conclusion was always why well, it's impossible in many species. To do that, and that's why I've left the mice, uh, and I'm now looking at uh, yeast, which have the really nice thing of button, which is one, you know, they're very easy to work with, but also they have a really tiny genome, so you don't need to do all that much to really get get an idea of uh, allele frequencies and transmission distortion. And what is nice about them is you can actually store them in this haploid state, and then you just cross them, which just means bringing two different haploids together, and they will mate immediately. They won't immediately um, undergo uh, meiosis, um, but you can just yeah, just starve them, and then they will create spores that are segregants uh, that are re uh, recombined, and then you pull all these spores together, and you have an idea of, okay, what is the allele frequency throughout the genome, and then you get an idea of how common is transmission distortion, and then hopefully you can get to a point where you can study uh, meiotic drive as well, because that's the first step you have to do, but then there's different ways to get to distortion. So what, I, what I'm doing at the moment is we have this wonderful phylogeny of all, of all Saccharomyces cerevisiae yeast. And we take, you know, strains from all across the phylogeny and we cross them together. I thought we just crossed them all, but actually that's way too much work, I realized. Um, but yeah, we cross them. We cross the most distant ones, basically, because if you have distance um, between them, you also have, uh, you know, maybe if there was meiotic drive, you might not have suppression of meiotic drive in the other system, so you can uncover the drive. Uh, but we're also interested in incompatibilities uh, and you would get them more um, if you cross them very distantly. And so just finally what this looks like, because I just got that data back, but I don't, not, don't yet know what's going on. This is sort of a good example cross of uh, the expectation. Uh, if there's no meiotic drive, no distortion going on. So what you see is the allele frequency, right? Uh, and 50% is the, so throughout the genome, uh, two parents I'm looking at loci that are opposite homozygous. So they, they, they don't share the same allele in, in the two crosses. And if it's one, then you have only the allele of one of the parents. If it's zero, you only have the allele uh, of, um, of the other parent. Uh, and so this is across 1,500 uh, segregants. So think about that in bias. I mean, <laughs> it's, yeah, would be even worse than what, I, what this was. But uh, 
Uh, yeah, so this is the expectation is nothing's going on. You have roughly 50% throughout the genome of transmission. Obviously, some noise there, but not too much noise. I mean, you could detect them. If it was here, you would know, oh, this is a, you know, uh, uncommon uh, frequency. And what you see sometimes is something like this, where you have some loci that are really distorted, uh, even though, you know, at the moment we don't know about the mechanism, but that's, you know, what we're now looking at. It could be something like simple and boring, even though people I work with like this as well, but I want to see drive. But it could be something like a genetic incompatibility where we think about, okay, individuals with this, a uh, combination of this locus and this locus are inviolable. And if they die, then this would, is what it would look like, right? Um, but it could also be, you know, maybe a driver with a non-susceptible locus in the other population. Uh, I'm in the lab where I have no one believes it's right, so I'm really hoping to find something and, and uh, annoy them with that. Um, but, um, you know, so you have a couple of crosses that look like that. Just to give you a few examples, there might be like this little something more complex like this, where, you know, maybe that's like, like a slight detrimental effect on survival throughout the genome. We don't know what's going on there yet. It's really weak. And we also have this, which is what I like the most at the moment, because if you would expect incompatibility, you would expect to see two loci involved. And here we only see one. So what I'm thinking, well, you know, this might be drive without suppression. Uh, and uh, it's really, you know, what you would like to see, a slow increase. So there's a linked region that is distorted. And uh, yeah, we don't know yet what's, what's going on, but I'm hoping to see something uh, interesting there. And what we're doing is basically we're looking at are there any structural differences in versions, for example, between uh, the two parents? Are there uh, an increase in repetitive elements, which goes both ways, can also distort and uh, create noise in the data, but is also very often found with drivers that they uh, target repetitive uh, sequences. Um, and also uh, population genetic signals, like uh, we have the whole phylogeny, right? And so we can look at selection and differences between local phylogeny and global phylogeny. So all these things I want to put together and see, okay, what might be going going on here? Uh, and so that that finishes that part, just to say, okay, we have many of those signals, but we don't yet know what's behind them. And we're using different different methods now to, to try and figure it out. And to sum this all up, um, basically we go uh, in the beginning, right, this idea of cooperation between, you know, different loci to, uh, to create this, this organism together and to engage in this enterprise. Uh, well, there's actually, you know, a little bit more perhaps to the story where we don't quite know um, how often, and we're trying to, we're getting closer and closer to figuring out how common it actually is to, to, uh, to find this sort of distortion and uh, maybe meiotic drive where genes really, uh, alleles really engage in, in competition within the genome. And uh, with that, thank you very much for your attention. Have you taken any questions, eh? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.